Welcome to University Drive, your pathway to the transformational work of University of the Bahamas. Our goal is to build a better Bahamas by shaping tomorrow's leaders today, finding solutions to challenges, and forging new opportunities for growth. University Drive, where faculty, staff, students, and alumni travel the road of progress together with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of University Drive. We're glad to have you join us. Our guest for this episode is Associate Professor of Sociology at University of the Bahamas, Dr. Nicolette Beckel. Welcome, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Tamika. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure. You have an open and standing invitation to come back, even though we haven't even, even though we haven't even gone into our conversation, right? Let me just get that out of the way. I will keep that in mind. You never know. I might definitely leverage that as we go forward. Absolutely. First, before we get into the essence of our conversation today, how have you fared the spring 2022 after so much tumult and the uncertainty of the last two years? How 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 have things been for you? It was an interesting semester. It's the first semester in almost 10 years that I have actually had the full load because I no longer have, I'm no longer occupying any of the administrative positions in the School of Social Sciences. They rotate. This is not like, you know, we don't, we rotate through these positions. And so um, it was an interesting semester in that I was teaching um, four classes, which I haven't done for a long time. Um, most of them were in the virtual modality, but I did have one that was face-to-face -face slash hybrid because we started off the semester in virtual, but this particular class, which was Junkanoo History, Politics, and Performance, um, required a hands-on engagement from the students, and so we held it in, in a very interesting kind of thing in one of the multimedia classrooms. I divided this, the class into two separate groups and they alternated. One week they were in on Zoom, the other week they were in person. Sounds like a fascinating class. Um, um, would I be correct in saying that it's been a period of stretching? <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. I mean, this, this class has been on the books for some time, but I think this is the first time that it's ever been offered. And it really, the students really responded very well to the content. They They've, in some cases, they found it transformative and it's been a long time coming. And I think that we need to be developing, well, what came out of the end of the class is not only do we need to be developing strands in studies that relate to Junkanoo, but maybe even consider the establishment of a Junkanoo Institute. After all, Trinidad has Carnival Arts Institute, the cultural um, Industries Institute, I can't remember what the specific title is. And, you know, we are well overdue for having the same here in the Bahamas. Well, we certainly have room to evolve and grow and to change, right? So we should take advantage of the space that we have for that. How have, your, student, how have your students been? What have you noticed about how um, you know, a lot of this, so it's interesting because it all depends on the level of class that you're teaching. A lot of the students um, are fatigued by the virtual environment. Um, and which is interesting because I think that faculty are, are finding their stride in the virtual environment in some cases, mm -hmm. but a lot of students are fatigued. And I think it really depends on the kinds of students or not the kinds the level of students that you have. Students coming in from high school always have transitional issues coming into the University of the Bahamas, um, especially given the fact that they are no longer being treated as individuals who need assistance in getting stuff done. We assume that they're adults and we treat them like adults. And a lot of times they flounder because the university, universities in general, and the University of Bahamas in particular, doesn't always have very clear um, channels by which people can find assistance. And that has been exacerbated by um, the move to the virtual environment because we're used to telephoning and walking in and face-to-face -face and going into offices. 
And people who have tried to do that have found it difficult, obviously, because we have only just in this semester returned to full face-to-face -face activity at the university. So I so, think, mm -hmm. no, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, 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 I'm sorry. So, cause I was trying to think if I answered your question. So I was trying to go back to, <laughs> to no, it. No, go so, ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so how are the students? The students are, um, it really depends. I found that my 400 level students and my 300 level students, some of them are really, really well adapted to the online environment. And some of them did some great stuff, some really good stuff. But I think that maybe what I'm noticing is the adjustment back to the face-to-face -face is bringing with it its own sets of challenges. I found that in the Junkanoo course where we had the face-to-face -face component that, that brought with it certain challenges as well. Um, so it's interesting. It's an interesting time. So I have this notion and the notion that I've been mulling over is one of the things that students are and, and people in general might need to really work on in terms of developing as a skill is the ability to adapt. What do you think yeah. about that? Yes. Um, I think the conscious ability to adapt. One of the things that I, that I um, concluded when I did my dissertation in anthropology, which was done on Bahamian um, national identity, is that Bahamians traditionally, without really realizing it, are really, really adaptable people. We're really good at adapting to change. And I tied that to the fact that we inhabit an archipelago, that we move back and forth among islands, and that we have developed the ability to we, we have, we're almost like chameleons. We develop the ability to change really um, well. But I think that's changing in the 21st century, possibly because um, more people are settled in and, 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 and solidly settled in for more than one generation in the capital and not moving so much, are not being faced with these changes necessarily as much as our forebears were, and therefore may be losing a measure of adaptability. So I think that we need to definitely work on those skills for sure. Very interesting. Um, transitioning now, uh, Dr. Bethel, you are conducting research that is potentially groundbreaking and which could actually inform public policy. And it relates to something that I would call a perplexing issue in the Bahamas. And I would imagine maybe throughout the Caribbean and that is land ownership and other related factors, but particularly um, it has implications for what I'd like to say are the vestiges that remain in the Bahamas because of our colonial past, right? And yeah. looking and, and, and coining it another scholarly way, the way in which you said it's spatial justice or mm -hmm. injustice is shaped and perpetuated. Now, that may be a big concept for many of us to wrap our minds around. So tell us, what is your research about and what are the implications of it? So thanks, Tamika. Um, uh, okay, so I guess I guess what I could, the best way for me to approach it is this, this arises from a problem that I came across when I was doing my PhD research, which was on national identity in the Bahamas. And, and I talked about the whole idea of adapt adaptability. But one of the things that I kept running across at that time was people kept saying, oh, the Bahamas doesn't have a national identity, right? Um, we don't have a national identity. This was back in the 90s. And I thought, but that's not true because we always were very quick to identify who's not Bahamian, right? That ain't a Bahamian name, that ain't a Bahamian thing, that ain't, Bahamians don't behave like that. Sure. So, so, you know, on, on one level, we, on, we can't articulate necessarily, or we couldn't at that time articulate a national identity, but we knew who we were, um, or we knew who we weren't, maybe is a better way to put it. Right. And so trying to get a handle on how to discuss that we know who we aren't kind of thing in my dissertation made me look at different areas. And one of the areas that I did look at, um, well, two of them relate to what I'm researching now. One of them was the idea of the archipelago. And the Bahamas is, you know, I don't, I don't like to, um, I don't like to always encourage this idea of the Bahamas as being unique because in many ways we're not as unique as we think. But in this particular way, we are unique. We are unique in that we are the largest archipelago in the Atlantic. We are a single country that is an archipelago. The, 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 the amount of 
sea and land that the Bahamas spans is larger than any single Caribbean country, although we don't think of it like that. This has created administrative challenges, problems, nightmares, um, issues that we have yet to address. The traditional way of addressing this, which may have been viable in, in the 1970s and the 1980s when we were a new country, which was developing economically and politically, et cetera, was to focus all developmental activity on New Providence and Nassau and to not focus that activity on any of the other islands, right? With the result that we now have a lopsided population, we now have a society where 70% of our population, I don't know what we'll find out in this census that's coming up, but 70, maybe 70 plus percent of our population occupies 1.5% of our available land. Stunning. And that brings with it a whole heap of problems, but it also suggests a whole lot of opportunity. So the question of space, spatial justice, how we negotiate this reality that we have, all of this territory, marine and land, but we have only concentrated our efforts on developing one particular spot of that territory, is feeds into this idea of spatial justice. Who we are, what we can achieve, what we can do, depends on where we are born in this country, right? 70% of us live in the capital, but that is the one part of the country that does not have its own local government authorities. So that means that 70% of the population is governed by a government whose responsibility is for the entire country and who does not have any specific legislated responsibility for the people who live on New Providence. So that's just one area of spatial justice. Then you ask the question about land ownership. And it's an interesting situation because our, our relationship to land um, has different, um, I don't know what the right term is, but is differently constituted in law. Let's put it like that, right? We have real estate and private property, which is what most people think of as land. We have crown land, which is the land that is the public patrimony of the whole country. We have generation property, which does not exist in law, but it is a customary land tenure tradition that we have maintained for two to 300 years. And then we have commonage, which is, from what I understand, one way in which some groups of people who have been practicing generation property have inscribed that practice in law. But the laws that we have on the books only enable us to convert real estate, private property, and potentially crown land, depending on what the government wishes to do with it, into revenue or into money, into cash. We can only leverage those two types of land ownership. We can't leverage common edge or generation property, right? At the same time, the fact that Bahamians own property through generation property and common edge gives them the kind of power that other Caribbean people did not have because the history of, of, of colonization and how the Caribbean was colonized, we were colonized for economic purposes almost exclusively. So basically what happened was colonizers came into the Caribbean, cleared the land of people and vegetation, planted cash crops, and that, um, trans that transformation of the land, much of the land in most of the other Caribbean countries and much of the good land in most of the Caribbean countries is held privately. And the ordinary citizens don't have extensive access to land in most of the other Caribbean countries. And one of the things that they did when they became emancipated was they created what they call family land where they would buy um, cast off pieces of land collectively, create villages that were administered in the way that we would recognize by generation property. In the Bahamas, generation property and commonage are huge tracts of land. We see them as problematic because we're currently in a moment where we believe that the primary use for land is to trans 
is to turn it into cash, right? To leverage money from the land. We don't always recognize the power that being a landowner also confers and recognize the danger in selling away land, right? So I see the, the, the traditions of generation property and commonage as a source of ordinary Bahamians power if we can find ways to write legislation that allows for that power also to become economic. I don't know if I don't know if I went too far off. So what truths are you seeking to uncover? What 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 information are you seeking to bring to the forefront, particularly in relation to nation formation? When we talk about this very uh, comprehensive subject matter that you're delving into. So um, the, the, the core concept that I'm drawing on is something called spatial justice. And spatial justice is the idea that inequities, inequality can be, or often is, um, reinforced, created, laid out geographically. And if we think about that in terms of Nassau, for example, we have the over the hill area, we have the Bay Street area in the traditional um, organization of Nassau. Over the, in front of the hill, the, the, um, the non over the hill area was reserved for the powerful, the economically viable, the owners of the land and of the people, right? Whereas over the hill was where the formerly enslaved and or the enslaved lived. So your world was bounded by geography and the kinds of, the kinds of inequities that you can follow, which I'm not necessarily gonna do in my book, but that you can follow historically looking at what services, for example, are provided on the northern side of that ridge that runs through the city of Nassau and what services are not provided when you come over the hill. If you think about what happened in 1967 when we got majority rule, the first thing that the government did was provide roads, running water and electricity for everybody who was not spread out along Bay Street and up that hill. So that's geographically, that is a geographical distribution of um, services that translates into enduring inequities. And we have not cracked that, right? We haven't necessarily changed those inequities that exist geographically. So I'm talking about spatial justice as an outcropping of our colonial past, because basically we just kind of moved into the structures that we inherited and we didn't necessarily sit down and say, well, what do we need as a nation to grow? How do we empower all parts of our archipelago in such a way that we can grow nationally and not just as the city of Nassau, which is really what we've done. You've, you've, you've bitten off a lot and it, it's much needed, I believe. There is a, a term that you've referred to in your research proposal that I think could help us to understand, um, continue to understand more of what you're doing and that is unjust geography. What do you yeah. mean by that? Well, unjust geography is a way of looking at um, how resources really are distributed, for example. And there's a number of different ways that you can concretize that you could look at it on the ground and see it, all right? So one of those things is, do you have running water or don't you, right? Which has often been a hot button topic for certain inner city communities. Do they yet have plumbing mm -hmm. available to them or not, right? Um, or where are the health services in a given society, right? We happen to inhabit a society, a, a, a nation where we have two hospitals in the capital one block away from each other and no hospitals in the southern Bahamas and one hospital that has a lot of challenges in our second city right so how you um how you plan your life depends on where you're born right how you plan your life depends on which services are available to you so we have situations to this day for example, where pregnant women in the family islands are 
in the habit of, or often request, find it necessary to, let me put it like that, to come to Nassau to have their children so that they can make sure that the, that birth certificate is registered, that they have the kind of medical care that they need and so on. Um, and that is unjust geography. So what does this all say about us um, and how we value ourselves and particularly in relation to our colonial past? Um, I would be, mm, that's a loaded question to yeah. me. Because, <laughs> because as I sit here and I, as I listen to you, right, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how many of us are deeply thinking about these things on this kind of level? Well, we're not because it's invisible to us, right? We take these things for granted because we inherited them. And um, it's so ingrained in us. And I don't, you know, I don't know why. We, I, I hope that, that the Wilson Awards are going to be exploring why it is so ingrained in us and why it's so invisible to us. And that's one of the dangers or one of the things that goes along with unjust geography. Because we inhabit a spatial world, in a lot of cases, the injustice is invisible to us, all right? We can see the differences. For example, when I teach spatial justice in my classes, I say, okay, so tell me what happens if you go to Super Value, which is the same chain, but Super Value in different locations on the island. What changes? What do you find? Mm -hmm. And so you can find that there's different produce, there's different prices, there's different, all kinds of things. And that depends on where you find yourself spatially on the island, okay? The question then is, um, how, do we, how do we take steps to make those geographies less unjust or more just? Mm -hmm. What things do we need to put in place? Is it legislation? I mean, or is it, um, a different set of policies? Do we provide tax incentives? All right, and we've tried, we've looked at some of those things, like for example, the Over the Hill Initiative was looking at tax incentives. The only issue about tax incentives is one of the things that maybe one needed to look at as well is how many people who actually live over the hill own the properties that they live in and can benefit from tax incentives. Because if you're a renter, you're not getting the benefit, right? The person who owns your property will get the benefit. So, so we need to look at we need to look at these things um, in a comprehensive fashion to understand where the inequities come. I and, think, and then institutionalize equitable distribution of resources and decision making, or or decision making that would yes. cause for there yes. to be equality yes. yes which is one of the reasons why i'm such a strong proponent of local government for new providence mm -hmm. i'm a strong proponent for local government for new providence because the central government as it exists is not equipped statutorily or in terms of resources to deal with that kind of restructuring of the city of Nassau and the island of New Providence that is required, right? Um, that's not something that, 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 that can or should be done by the central government because the, the level of work that has to be done will mean inevitably what has always happened. And that is that when the central government invests time and energy in this um, for New Providence, then it is neglecting the rest of the country, which is its remit, right? Um, so we need local government, municipalities in New Providence to begin to grapple with these issues. So is that a part of your research, your research? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. The idea of local government and the fact that 70% of our population does not have local government, that is a glaring inequity. And it's geographical in nature. Because if you live in Nassau, you, don't have, you, you only have your MP and your MP is not empowered to do anything, even though you think he is or she is under the constitution, they are not really empowered to meet your needs. That's what local governments do around the world. MPs have done it here 
because they are, they feel impelled to serve, they feel called to serve. But I don't know what the census is going to reveal, but chances are we have a quarter of a million people living in New Providence, right? An MP who does not have a municipal, a municipal office with full-time people working for the city and not for the MP's party is not equipped to meet those needs. Absolutely not. Wow, we, we are getting into some really uh, intriguing conversation here. So we're, we're taking a deep dive with Dr. Nicolette Bethel, who is doing research on spatial justice and particularly in relation to nation formation. This is a good place for us to take our first break. We'll be back with University Drive after this. My name is Tracy Thompson, and I am here as a Wilson Award grant recipient. My research publication is called That Black Men Could Rule. With the rise of European power over the past 500 years or so against the Arabs and then over time against other opponents has come the rise of an ideology. That ideology maintains that whiteness has special value and that people who possess this particular property can lay claim to a higher level of humanity. That perspective in turn has led to what can only be called a sustained assault on the idea of blackness. And part of that assault has taken the form of claims that black men cannot think. And if black men can think, they cannot feel. And that if black men can feel, they do not care. And these stereotyped claims have been muted in the past 50 years or so. Uh, but they are experiencing a resurgence. I hope that the study demonstrates that the university can continue to produce intellectual products of uh, global caliber. For more on the Wilson Awards and the Wilson Grants to fuel Bahamian research, contact grants at ub.edu.bs. Chapter One Bookstore is your back-to-school headquarters. We are proud to serve the students, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas and the community at large. We are the premier choice for the purchase of university textbooks and supplies and UB logo apparel, paraphernalia, and gifts. We also carry a wide variety of school supplies, learning aids, and leisure books. Visit our coffee center throughout the semester for all of your printing, copying, and binding needs. Chapter One Bookstore is located on the ground floor of the Michael Elden Complex. Shop with us on Monday through Friday between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 1 p.m. Call us at 397-2650 or email us at chapter1 at uv.edu.bs. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chapter One Bookstore. See you soon! Hi, I'm Sonia Farmer and I'm a 2022 Wilson Award grant recipient. So my research project is called Indelible and it's an oral history archive documenting experiences with and within citizenship, with and within the Bahamas. And this project is composed of three parts. Overall, it's a digital humanities project, but there is an oral history archive which contains testimonies um, engaging with experiences with citizenship in this country. The second part is a collaborative art project where the participants also complete an altered voters card however they would like. And the third component is an educational framework which provides toolkits so that we can engage with um, the crisis of citizenship in this country. So even though I'm coordinating this project and I've conceptualized this project, it's really primarily a collaborative project. I will be working with at least um, 50 different people speaking to me um, about their experiences with citizenship to make up this oral history archive. And I will also be working with historians, artists, human rights lawyers, um, and many other folks to create educational frameworks on the website as well so that we can engage with the history of citizenship and the current reality of citizenship. So it's really a collaborative project and I'm really excited to be 
bringing everyone together to examine what it means to be Bahamian. For more on the Wilson Awards and the Wilson Grants to fuel Bahamian research, contact grants at ub.edu.bs. Welcome back to University Drive. We have as our special guest, Dr. Nicolette Bethel, who is the, an associate professor of sociology at University of the Bahamas, and she's conducting research on spatial justice. And Dr. Bethel, your research project was one of four that recently received the Wilson Grant under the Wilson Award Initiative which really is uh, Sir Franklin Wilson, Sharon Lady Wilson, the Wilson Family Foundation, working with University of the Bahamas to incentivize Bahamian research and the production of new knowledge. What do you think of such an effort, particularly now, as we stand almost on the cusp of our 50th anniversary of independence? I can only applaud the Wilson family for taking this step because it is this kind of investment in um, Bahamian intellectual activity that will bear fruit down the line. Because when you look at any policy legislation or whatever, wherever we are in the world, it comes out of deep thought. And we have inherited a society in which deep thought is not part of our, um, I don't know what to call it. It has not been encouraged among us and it was not encouraged among us because we have come out of a, a history of enslavement and colonialism where deep thought was inherently dangerous to the powers that be. And so the formerly colonized and the formerly colonized who were also formerly enslaved have to begin to develop for themselves a uh, um, value for deep thought and deep thought that is specific to them. One of the things that has frustrated me in my adult life has been watching the government attempt to solve problems that I would argue are unique in the Bahamas, in the Bahamian situation by bringing in consultant after consultant after consultant from some other part of the world and trying to find a patch for an issue that may not have a parallel somewhere else, right? If consultants were being identified by thinking, okay, so what other countries have faced this issue of dealing with the archipelago and dealing with an archipelago that has vast differences in wealth and, and access and so on. If, if consultancies were handled in that kind of a way, I might not have such a big problem but we have traditionally tried to solve our issues by bringing in people from outside who do not have the context that may be necessary. So investing in people who are given the luxury of, of time and effort looking into issues, engaging in deep thought, wrestling with challenging questions that are specific to the Bahamas is invaluable. And that is how innovation and ideas that have moved other civilizations forward, that's how it's done. So I totally applaud this, this endeavor and encourage others to take similar steps. So what you have just said reinforces to me why it is that it is so important for University of the Bahamas to succeed and to continue realizing its mission. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that has always been my argument because, you know, we wrestled for so long with this idea that, that the Bahamas needs a university, this whole idea that, that all we need is a training center. That is the colonial model. It's this idea that the vast majority of the people in this country are not citizens, but drones who need to be employed. And all that we need to do for them is to give them the skills to meet the needs of employers. That has a built-in inequity, and that is a colonial model that is not, I, I don't think it, it is in any way appropriate for a nation that is trying to find itself. A nation 
should be developing its own talent, its own human capacity to solve its own problems. And therefore, a university whose purpose is to engage in new knowledge, to do the research that allows us to see these things is critical for a country and particularly a country such as ours. We have many parallels with the rest of the Caribbean, but the one difference is that very few of them have, have the challenges that we have. Very few of them have the fundamental issues that the Bahamas faces. That issue that says, I mean, the Bahamas has more airports than any other Caribbean country, mm -hmm. right? And then many other Latin American countries because we need them. They're expensive, but we can't do without them, right? We need them because we're an archipelago. And having that kind of a conversation is absolutely necessary. What is it that we need? And how does that make us different? And then how do we solve those problems that come from that? So as you continue with your studies, with your research, how, do you, how are you doing that? What is your methodology? Well, now you've done it. Okay, so the, the thing that I found, what I have done um, with regard to the grant is I have engaged research assistants to help me with some of the volume of the work that has to be done. Because as an anthropologist, I want to, um, to engage the methodology of, of observation, participant observation, ethnography, which are being there. The anthropologist is, the anthropologist has the method of living in a society. Well, I live in New Providence, so I can talk about New Providence, but also what's the difference between living in New Providence and living on a family island? Do we in Nassau even have any real conceptualization of what one has to do, even if one has a toothache and one lives far outside of the capital, lives on another island, all right? Or if you have an accident or if you break your leg, like what are the implications of basic things like that, right? And where are the gaps? Um, so one of the things that I have, um, that I'm seeking to get the research assistants that I am working with to do is to help me to transcribe interviews, to um, help me to deal with field notes that I take when I travel and so on. So um, I have, like, as I say, engaged research assistants to help me at least catalog the data that I will be using. Um, yeah. The other process is just taking the time to write because as people might notice, these are things that I've been thinking about for a long time and that were kind of um, crystallized by the involvement that I had some about five, six years ago now with the Sustainable Exuma Project, which was um, a joint project between the Bahamian government and Harvard University on how to develop another archipelago, the archipelago of the Exumas, sustainably. And the process and the experience I had of visiting the various islands of the Exumas really showed how much it matters where you find yourself in this archipelago, right? And how much work we have to do to reduce or to combat the unjust geographies that we have inherited and that we have created. Um, in the research that you do, the work in and of itself is honorable, as is making that work available for consumption, whether that's at the government level for governance or in the private sector or civil society. But isn't there a level of frustration when it comes to you putting in all of this work, right, and not really seeing a real, ac real action, real tangible steps, sustainable changes as a result of the information that you are uncovering. How do we bridge that gap? Um, so that is a, that's a, that is a really, that's a really close question. That's close to, to my heart <laughs> in terms of the frustration. Um, I think that the way I deal with it is the idea that change is incremental, particularly when you're trying to change cultures. And when you're trying to change a culture, that was, 
I think one of the things that we need to, to acknowledge is that the inequities that we have inherited were deliberately created. They were not accidental. They were deliberately created and there were policies and laws and structures that were put in place to create and maintain those inequities. You mean from our the, colonial past? Yes, mm -hmm. to empower, to allow a minority of people to control a majority of people who were not like them. So um, taking dismantling that is a long process. So I, the way I deal with it and the frustration is to see my work as just part of the part of the building blocks of, of what we can put in its place and part of the tools by which we are dismantling what we've inherited. Um, and, and just to know that it's a long process. But one of the things that I would say is that it is also part of um, the long work that is being done towards or to bolster the call for reparations um, for slavery and colonialization, colonization that the Caribbean has engaged in against the former colonizing powers. Because one of the arguments against reparation is that there is no evidence that harm was done. But I, spatial justice for me is concrete evidence of the harm that was done and continues to be done. And if the only thing that happens out of the research that I do is that people are able to look at their society and at our country slightly differently and see the inequities spatially, I will have achieved something. Let's talk about what are the outputs for your research? How do you intend to make it available, accessible, so that it can be consumed by Bahamians and make a difference? Oh, wow. Okay, so my, my output is I'm writing a book. And I know that the response is, oh, Bahamians don't read. That, that's like putting it, making it a big secret. Nobody's going to read it. Yeah, you know, I don't necessarily buy that because I know plenty of Bahamians and they read. And it doesn't, you don't need everybody to read the book. You just need a future leader to read the book and then you might get massive change, right? So the main input for me is a book. Along the way, I have my blog. Um, I would love to be engaged in discussions through podcasts, through, you know, just discussions where we talk through these kinds of ideas, just putting them out there on the table, allowing people to hear these ideas is all part of the conversation and all part of the, of the process. But for me, the deliverable, the ultimate deliverable is going to be a book that articulates some of the things that are, have been running through my head, tormenting me for the past seven, eight, 10 years. And, and, and when, do you, when do you plan to bring your torment to an end? For how long do you intend? <laughs> are you anticipating so, research? So, okay. class? <laughs> so I, that is a question that is beyond my capacity to answer. The good thing about the grant is that I have to produce a chapter by the end of the year. And my goal is to finish one chapter and to be well into writing at least another one. I'm going to... Um, my, my idea is to build on, or to get the low-hanging fruit, to build on some of the observations that came up in the dissertation and to write them into the context of spatial justice and to analyze them through the lens of spatial justice, thereby creating at least one chapter, if not two. And then of course, there's also the question of writing articles, but also of writing, as I said, blog posts and engaging on different levels uh, talking about these kinds of things. You have um, indicated some pretty big terms in your research proposal that I think we should talk a little bit about exogenous, endogenous, <laughs> and mesogeographies. How, right. how, how, how are those things related to what you are trying to uncover? Okay. So those are big words, and I am not wedded to having that in the book. 
Um, <laughs> one of the great things about the process of getting the grant is you also get feedback on your proposal. And one of the points in the feedback was these things need to be defined. So I get these ideas from the foremost thinker on spatial justice, a man by the name, a geographer by the name of Edward Soja, who articulated these things in such a way that they crystallized for a lot of people and galvanized a lot of work that's being done across the social sciences today. So these are his terms. So when he talks about exogenous geographies or endogenous geographies, he's just looking at different scales. So endogenous geographies would be those things that are the closest to us. They would be things like um, who lives behind gates in a gated community and who doesn't, for example. And that whole question about um, one could uh, uh, like, and where you live, do you have access? What kinds of schools are serving you? What kinds of clinics are serving you? What kinds of bus routes serve you? How do you get around? right? That would be what he calls endogenous geography at the level of the individual human being. How does living where you live affect your life? If we go to the lockdown, for example, during COVID-19 and the fact that you were not permitted to step outside your door, how much thought was given when the powers that were um, made that decree? How much thought was given to the fact that there are a lot of people in New Providence whose door is just to the room in which they sleep, right? They live in yards with small structures. And if you say you can't step outside your door, what are you doing to that person? They can't even go outside to eat or, you know what I mean? So um, that would be an example of endogenous geography. Geography, the space that you inhabit at your individual level. Exogenous geography could be something as big as the world. The fact that when Europe began its expansion across the world, it divided the world cognitively and geographically into the old and the new, right? And the new was there and the, 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 all the things that they defined the new as for, the new was for generating revenue for the old, all right? There was no equality between the two. That in itself would be, an exogenous geography, geography at the global level. And mesogeographies could be something in between. Like, how is that impacted a meso? You could say perhaps that the way in which the Bahamas is administered could be an example of mesogeography, or even the way in which the region functions, the Caribbean region could be mesogeography. So it's just a matter of determining the size and the scope of what you're looking at when you're talking about spatial justice. And of course, these terms can be shrunk or expanded as you like, right? So I could say, well, maybe the Americas is my exogenous geography, right? I'm not dealing with the whole world. I'm just dealing with our hemisphere. And then, you know, my neighborhood is an endogenous geography. So they're just, they're just fancy jargon terms. But thinking about these things, is, an, is, is a useful process when you're trying to articulate um, the kinds of things that affect justice. Um, and when you start to put that in a spatial context, thinking your way through these terms is possibly more important than actually using the terms. Wow, I love the fact that I'm getting an education from a world-class university professor without even having to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> who, could, who could beat that, right? <laughs> so our time is waning, but before we go, I want to talk about the whole idea of turning 50 as a nation. What does that mean for us? And what does that mean for us in terms of nationhood? What should we be as a nation at 50? The Bahamas, that is. Oh, wow. Oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> heavy one, right? That is a heavy one. Um, you know, I, 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 we should have been, I don't know, Tamika, that's really hard because it makes me think of the promise of 1973 and ask the question, did we live up to the promise of 1973 or did we sell it? 
we have come a long way economically. We have invested, the Bahamas has done great things economically and we have a lot to show. If, if somebody from 50 years ago came into 2023 um, or 2022, they wouldn't recognize the Nassau that they would see. But you know what? They would, they would recognize to their sorrow some of the family islands because they don't look that much different, but they feel different because the people are not there, right? So I would, what we've achieved is we've achieved massive urbanization. Um, and I think that it's time for us to now start thinking about how to reverse that, how to change that, how instead of focusing all of our energy on making Nassau grow, how do we have several centers of population throughout our archipelago? And how do we have them grow in a sustainable fashion, not necessarily doing to their environments and their islands what we have done to New Providence, this beautiful, wonderful island that we inhabit, but that we have really done a number on, right? Um, how do we deal with the things that come with urbanization, transportation, equity, waste disposal, um, all of these things are, are the kinds of things that we touch on with spatial justice, right? Um, how do we deal with energy provision? How do we deal with um, inter-island transportation? How do we deal with natural resources, mineral deposits, the rock that we use when we are building, the oceans, the coasts? How do we deal with these things um, on a national level in such a way that we can have centers of population that grow healthily, um, flourish, that thrive. Because the opportunity that we have, if we only inhabit 1.5% of our land, is boundless over the next 50 years. If the sea level doesn't just swallow us up, we have a lot of potential. Much food for thought. Any final wrap-up comments? We are nearing we're at the end of our time together but i don't know i mean where i was going when i said sea level i'm tempted to say well let me just throw it out there as a question right rather than making a statement so if we want to talk about exo exogenous geographies and injustice you only need to go and watch the prime minister's speech at the cop um where he talked about how countries like ours are at most at risk from climate change because of the actions of countries that are not ours, right? That is, that's spatial injustice on a huge scale. We didn't cause the problem, but we are the ones who are gonna be flooded, right? Um, so how do we think through that? That's, I guess, the question that I want to leave people. I'm I like on such a high note. I love ending on a thought-provoking note. Thank you so much for that. You <laughs> are <guest>. welcome. <laughs> Our guest for this episode has been Associate Professor of Sociology. Did I say that right? That is absolutely right. That is my <laughs> substantive title, even though I'm an anthropologist. I'm an associate Anthrop professor of sociology. Yes. Anthropologist and research expert, Dr. Nicolette Beffo. Thank you so much for joining us on Thank University you, Drive. Nicole. Like I said, you have a standing invitation to return. Just let us know and we'll make it happen. This has been University Drive. I've been your host, Tamika Lundy, signing off for now. Thank you so much. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations and the Communications and Creative Arts Academic Unit at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.